<clears throat> so, um, yeah, so I'm Martin Wynn from the uh, University of Oxford, uh, where I work in the linguistics department. Uh, I've been involved in Clarin for a long time um, and was uh, involved in the early, uh, the original meetings that when Clarin was founded, dating back to around 2006, I think. Um, so what I've got to say to, to add to um, Andreas's presentation is um, something a bit more in uh, focusing on the topic um, for the workshop of Clarin and libraries. It's not an official statement of Clarin's um, position on libraries. It's more my sort of personal view of some of the areas that we should explore in the workshop. Um, some just to bring up some points for, for discussion. Um, so the, the main motivation for the workshop uh, when we first thought of it, as Andres says, some, some years ago, um, was the recognition that there were a number of uh, major initiatives emerging uh, relating to delivering textual content um, and delivering content from large text collections um, for readers, but also for researchers. And that some of these um, projects were in um, kind of uh, uh, were in libraries, others were in Clarin centres, and others were in different sorts of organisations. Um, but the projects were often fairly disconnected from each other. Um, and also disconnected from research infrastructures. So we thought it was a good time to discuss uh, sharing experiences, methods, tools, uh, uh, what plans we have, uh, and looking for some potential areas of collaboration. Um, the idea first came to me actually um, uh, in a meeting organised by uh, Neil Jeffries, who's here from, also from Oxford, when he invited uh, guys from Text Plus come to Oxford to talk about their plans and discuss possible collaborations uh, and they talked about their connections with Clarin and I kind of thought what a good idea that was and that it would be good to discuss you know, a more general um, collaboration between research infrastructures um, and libraries in particular. Um, so the workshop was originally called um, Interoperability of Text Platforms for Digital Libraries but but it wasn't really, it's was a bit of a mouthful and it wasn't really sexy enough. So we kind of put Clarin and libraries was kind of um, uh, worked a bit better. Um, but the, the idea is that a lot of different solutions are currently emerging that aim to provide access to digital textual content. Um, and that, that there, were, there were dangers of creating digital silos, um, reinventing the wheel, ignoring relevant expertise, in different sectors and not making the maximum uh, out of the potential there. I mean, the, the usual problems with digital initiatives and projects. So I hope we can have a free and open discussion here about the um, uh, various areas for discussion between libraries and research infrastructures. Um, this has been conceived mainly as a Clarion event, but very happy to have um, Sally Chambers here, who's the director of DARIA. Um, and Perhaps whenever I say Clarin, think of it as shorthand for Clarin and Daria, because this is really about research infrastructures and um, and libraries, and uh, we should be thinking about you know, potential for collaboration between uh, between libraries and these two research infrastructures. Um, so people are a bit further away from the slides than I expected, but can you more or less read out of the back? Yeah, good. Um, so I, at the risk of oversimplifying things and doing this rather crudely, I want to point out some differences between the two communities of practice. Um, on the one hand, you've got Clarion a research infrastructure, which has come out of the communities mainly of computational linguists and corpus linguists and linguists of various type doing digital work. And on the other hand, uh, research libraries, uh, university libraries, national libraries and other um, yeah, and digital libraries broadly defined. So, for the um, this is clearly something of an artificial separation, and there's lots of areas of where people are already working and crossing over and collaborating, and, and there are people with feet in both camps. But I thought it might be useful just to kind of do this artificial separation to, um, and then see where the areas of contact are. So firstly, for the Clarin community, um, when it comes to textual data, we're often talking about 
uh, a corpus containing multiple texts representative of a particular language variety that's been created for research purposes. Um, it's perhaps the data type that's most relevant here. There are also all sorts of other data types managed by Clarin centers, all sorts of lexical resources um, and quite a variety. Uh, in terms of tools, um, we're talking mainly about tools that analyze texts, do things like can create concordances, collocations, clusters of words, keywords, uh, and also tools for annotating text. We're doing linguistic annotation of text in particular, but also quite a lot of expertise in working with different sorts of metadata. Um, and in terms of methods, what people are using text for from the sort of Clarion communities is kind of data driven, evidence based research into language. And it's more in the kind of distant reading area. It's not so much you know, doing um, analysis, close analysis of a particular text, but putting together these collections like a corpus that can allow you to get an overview to answer questions like you know, how has English grammar changed in the 20th century in terms of grammar, grammaticalization of modal verbs? And to, in order to answer that sort of question, you need to be able to work through lots of data to gather text from different times uh, and put them together and analyze them. So those, those are the sorts of linguistic research questions that people from uh, this community have. Um, I'm a bit worried about kind of saying what people do in libraries. It's not really my um, it's not really my place. Um, so this is an official statement of what Claren thinks people do in libraries, but it's an area I know less about, but I'll try a crude summary for you anyway as a starting point for the discussion and not not the end point, I hope. Um, so as we know, libraries carry out the, the essential task of giving users access to content uh, increasingly via um, that you know, increasingly that's digital content and increasingly via the outputs of digitization projects and born digital data. Um, and so one key type of data that they have is digitized copies of books or born digital books and other text collections um, like newspaper collections and things like that. So um, kind of data in terms of tools. Um, obviously records, metadata are important to be able to search and find uh, individual items from these collections is very important. And increasingly they're in the business of providing um, a display of these texts for online reading or for downloading and um, uh, reading that way. Um, lots of other tools as well, and I think um, I'll rely on you guys to, to tell us what, what, what else you do. And in terms of methods, it, a lot of this is more about accessing the content of books, so it's supporting close reading for the uh, you know, typical use case is the, uh, the researcher who wants to find a particular book uh, and read it, to put it at its crudest. And so there's that you know, one separation we could perhaps make between the, uh, the types of data and data and tools and methods that we have is that Claring is more about supporting distant reading. Uh, digital library is more about supporting close reading. Uh, discuss. Because of course there, are, of course there are fuzzy boundaries, uh, overlaps uh, and interfaces between the two. In particular, in the case of are in language resource repositories. So a lot of the centers that Andreas talked about are repositories of digital data and tools. Uh, repositories such as uh, Lindat at Charles University in Prague, the Deutsches Textarchiv, uh, the Oxford Text Archive, um, which are Clarion centers and are primarily sources of corpora and texts. Um, some uh, and there are good examples of Clarion language resource repositories which do um, allow users to uh, to do to do both things. Deutsches Text Archive is a good example. You can access the, the text. It's a digital library, but you can also connect the text to um, computational linguistics tools. And it allow, they allow users to apply tools to texts and corpora. Um, so lots of Clarion centers offer sort of corpus linguistic interfaces to corpora and to collections. Um, a lot of these you'll be familiar with. Claren doesn't take credit for all of them. As Andrea said, we don't necessarily in the business of creating these things, but we we look to sustain and, and sustain them and make them interoperable. But things like Voyant tools, 
that you may know, Sketch Engine, CQP Web, um, are very widely used interfaces for mainly by linguists and corpus linguists, but increasingly also by social scientists and people who are interested in the content uh, of the text and want to take a, a data driven, a big data approach to their research. Um, what's less common and I think will be an interesting thing to explore is the ability to define your own virtual corpus because the way that these things could really come together is if you could use a library catalog to search and define say I want um, uh, regional newspapers from Germany from the 1920s or all novels written by women in published in Britain in 1800 to 1820 define your corpus that way using the sophisticated metadata and search tools that we have and then apply the sophisticated text analysis tools we have to that virtual corpus that doesn't really happen at the moment if someone's cracked that please tell us about it um, there'll be plenty of opportunities for that but normally you know certainly what the Clarion centers do there'll be pre-indexed sets of you know sets of data we'll choose you know, someone might well have made a, uh, a corpus of 19th century British novels and put them together but they have to be indexed and prepared so that the tools can be operated on them so creating virtual corpora on the fly I think um, is certainly one area where these two sides could could really come together um, for those of you who are less familiar with some of the Clarin um, tools and corpus linguistic tools, just look at those briefly. So a typical Clarin Centre, this is the Norwegian one, would offer a platform where you can select a corpus and then apply tools to get, uh, this is, don't worry if you can't read this, you can probably see from there that it's a concordance, that's all you need to know, and there's a list of, list of corpora. Um, so that's a, a typical use, typical um, kind of functions that a Clarence Centre will uh, will offer, usually focused on the sorts of operations which are um, beloved of corpus linguists doing things like the, the concordances, collocations, uh, keywords, word lists and that sort of thing and analysing text according to different dimensions. So it might be, you know, it could be um, uh, one of the examples I use for if, um, if the time of publication of the text is, is in the metadata, you might be able to compare text from the 1920s with text from the 1930s within that corpus interface. Um, so lots of them do concordances. Some of them do some really cool stuff like Diacolo again um, uh, from the BBRV in, in Berlin. Uh, I'd recommend you go and have a look at this because it's um, I decided it was too complicated to try and show you this, but basically you search for a word and then you it runs over a timeline, gives you a word cloud of the collocations of that word. What you see at the beginning is in 1610, the word Faulheit was most frequently uh, associated with the uh, Nachlässigkeit. Uh, and over time, it will tell you, show you the collocations. This is one of the cooler tools that, uh, that people have, but at the moment is only available as far as I understand it to work with the kind of pre-processed pre collections. What it does also do though, which all of the good uh, interfaces do, is if you find an interesting example you can click on this and it will show you the concordances of all of them and if you think one of those is particularly interested you can click on the text and go into the text and see the expanded context and in fact uh, then go further and see the whole text uh, and uh, the page image as well. So it kind of allows you start off with distant reading, looking at the wide picture of how what happens in these texts over time. But you can drill down and get to the actual text and work out. Because it may be quite often you you can be misled if you only do the distant reading. There may be something happening uh, that the close reading reveals. Uh, so I think the good texts allow um, what uh, Martin Muller uh, in Northwest University in America calls. Uh, scalable reading that you can you can go between close and, and distant reading. Um, one other aspect of things that Clarin tools uh, can offer, I'd like to mention, which I think might be particularly important, is linguistic annotation, because one of the barriers to more flexible systems is the rather annoying fact that annotation is necessary for effective search of texts. So if you wanted to look um, this is from a, from a Czech corpus. If you want to look at the verb uh, to speak in, in Czech, you find in a highly inflected language like this, 
uh, you need to know what all the different inflected forms of the verb are, and they can be there can be dozens of them. Um, search can be very ineffective without that kind of linguistic knowledge embedded in the either in the text or in the search. And so that's an area where I think you know the expertise of the communities associated with Clarin can usefully come together with the um, uh, people holding the large text collections to enable better search. Um, so uh, just to go into this example a little bit further, um, I know you can't read that one. It's a it's a letter by Voltaire, okay, from a, a collection in in Oxford, the Electronic Enlightenment. Um, so it's part of a uh, a large collection of um, uh, of correspondence uh, focused around the sort of French Enlightenment, but a bit wider than that. Um, and I want to use this as an example to show you how more prob even more problems occur when you try to deal with historic texts. You haven't just got the problem of inflected forms uh, of words. You've got the problems of uh, things like spelling variation and historical variance. Because if you try to run um, a, a modern French uh, uh, part of speech tagger over this, it would fall over quite swiftly uh, unless it had been trained on historical text. Because a lot of the, simply put, a lot of the spellings are very different, even though it's you know, it's not from very long ago. Um, it comes from a period before a major reform of French spelling and uh, uh, various grammatical changes have happened in French since. So even if you wanted to search for a particular verb, say pouvoir, so you wanted to know about, you know, to be able to it can in French, not only have you got the problem that there are lots of inflected forms, there are lots of different variant spellings over, over time as well. And so doing a, a word search in type text like this is... Um, it's not very effective in general, and it's a bit. I think it's a big problem for users. What adding annotation can do is you can, if you've got the right tools and you've been trained on the right sort of data, this is the same letter, one word per line, um, with the uh, um, a modernised form of the, the word, a part of speech tag, and the lemma, the dictionary head word, um, uh, that's been applied to it, and so and that would enable the user to search on any of these levels. You just search for the, say, if you want all the forms of avoir, it will search for all of those. Uh, and if you want to, uh, you don't know how a word was, you didn't know how a word was spelt, um, you could search for et, uh, and you get hits for est if you specify it. So adding annotation can help with search, and in fact is essential for search, I think, I would argue, on in inflected languages and historical text. Um, it's not perfect. I, I did this myself, so I'm not blaming anybody else. Um, it didn't I identify Nautch there uh, for some reason, um, but uh, the tools aren't perfect. And I'd say Clarin isn't saying that we've got the tools to do this automatically now. You know, we're not offering as a service tagging of 18th century French text, but we could be involved in projects to develop the tools to do it. Um, I will. So um, just to, another example of this, this is searching for pouvoir in a text that has been annotated uh, and I found there were 118 variants in the text of uh, 18th century French correspondence. There are 118 forms of pouvoir due to the n large number of inflections, which all have a different orthographic form in French, but also because of a, a wide variation in um, orthography. Um, Clarin has been working on this. Uh, again, don't worry if you can't read this. This is just some screenshots of some things that Clarin has been doing in this area. Uh, workshops dating back to um, eight years at the Huygens Institute, where we looked at uh, some of these problems. Uh, another workshop that we had in Berlin uh, a couple of years ago. Um, and we've got a, a resource guide for tools for normalization. And um, uh, historical corpora as well. So we've got some, we have been developing some expertise in these areas, which I think do particularly touch on some of the concerns of uh, those holding um, historical digital text collections. So, um, so I think in terms of summarising what are the areas that we could talk about in this workshop, I think there's, uh, there's the, um, sorry, that's the wrong way, okay. Uh, 
there's the stuff to do with uh, linguistic annotation. I think we can help there. There's the stuff to do with the data that's in the libraries and the analysis, linguistic analysis tools and the pl platforms for text delivery and linguistic analysis, whether they can be brought together. There's also um, Claren's expertise on in working with more flexible ways of connecting together um, tools uh, for analysis uh, through things like the, the switchboard. Very much at a development stage at the moment, but the idea is that um, this is that I mean you can do it already to a to a limited extent. Pavel here from uh, Prague Charles University can tell tell you more about this. But if you identify a text, it will tell you which tools will work with it. A text in this format in this language, you can apply these tools to it. And the, so we're looking at more certainly looking at more flexible ways for applying um, or joining together data and tools. So some possible next steps. So I'd suggest I'm making some suggestions for Mary's to talk about, but I want I'm sure others will emerge and I'm sure there's some things I've got wrong and some things that I've missed here. Um, but I think we can talk about sharing our platforms and tools for delivering textual data. So part, possibly sharing ones that come from Clarion with data from the libraries, but probably the other way around as well. Um, there's tools for the analysis and annotation of text to enable more effective search. And then there's ways of uh, connecting tools and text more flexibly and chaining them together in possible pipelines. Because if you want to um, identify uh, named entities, say people and places in a text, uh, you don't just apply a named entity recognizer to it. You probably need to apply a tokenizer to identify where the word boundaries are, then a part of speech tagger. Uh, and then something that's going to recognize the noun phrases uh, and then you start to identify it. So often processing pipelines are necessary. Uh, and if you're dealing with uh, texts of a particular character, they probably need to be trained on, say, French text from 1740, not uh, specifically. Uh, there are other potential goals for the um, for the workshop as well as uh, identifying these areas and other areas that we might identify. Uh, just finding out more about each other, about our data tools, methods and plans. I've probably revealed a lot of gaps in my knowledge uh, already, so I'm, I'm happy to be to find out uh, more about um, what you're doing and what you're up to. Um, I like to I said using the email list. What I really mean is creating something of a community. The reason we wanted to have not to uh, have this meeting online in the last two years is we thought we want to create a new some new connections between people. So we wanted to have it uh, face to face. And we do already have a, the email list which people can use to communicate and to uh, to ask questions and to advertise what you're doing. Uh, because I, although I think if we're really successful, I think we'll we'll come up with some ideas for joint projects that we can pursue. Uh, one minor idea I've had already is that uh, in terms of summarizing the outcomes of this meeting, we could present a paper at something like the a TPDL um, conference, which has a track for uh, new innovative approaches and new work, and I think we could report there. Um, and there's also the possibility for another topic, possibly funded by Clarin, possibly by somebody else. But uh, if we, uh, we, as the workshop progresses, we'll we can uh, investigate some of these ideas and perhaps come back and focus on them specifically at the uh, at the very end. So um, the main goals of Clarion uh, is are to um, uh, construct an integrated and interoperable and also scalable research infrastructure structure, uh, of, and we do this by the means of a network of centers. Uh, we deploy somehow linguistic data tools and services, but our target groups are not linguists, at least not only linguists. Uh, they are uh, scholars from the humanities in a broad sense and also from the social sciences. But if uh, people from the hard sciences are interested in our data, we are uh, also collaborating with them. The central structure. The central structure of Clarion is an organization of centers. Clarion centers host the infrastructure where provide central services 
are, for instance, the persistent identifiers, they provide search tools, they host data, they train, and they do some dissemination, and they build a supporting community. Some of these things you will see. But what are these centers? So you see a um, uh, map here, and uh, this is a European map, although we also have, uh, as you will see in a minute, um, centers that are not located in Europe. But what you can see here is that you have Bs and Cs and Ks, and these are types of centers that host the infrastructure. And this infrastructure is distributed at least from its, um, um, yeah, in, in Europe and with some satellites. Clarin is um, Eric. For those of you who do not know there, uh, Eric, Eric is a legal entity. It is an European Research Infrastructure Consortium, and the members of ERICS are countries. The governance of Clarion is that these members send a representative. They are the, in, 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 in a certain way, uh, the, the government, governance, governing structure, the General Assembly. There's a scientific advisory board, but there's also, of course, a board of directors and several committees. The board of directors is led by Francisca de Jong, who's here, and there's also Dieter van Alkenk, who couldn't make it. Uh, he also uh, intended to come here. And there's Francesca Frontini and Antal van den Bosch. Uh, Antal van den Bosch and Francesca Frontini do it part-time, so we have uh, a kind of a uh, they have some other obligations in Italy or in the Mertens Institute, uh, respectively. Uh, the two co-organizers of this workshop, uh, two of the two of the co-organizers of this workshop, uh, Martin Wynn and I, have also been uh, at some point uh, part of this board of directors. The members are states, are countries, as I mentioned. All of these members in a way pay a membership fee this is paid by the countries but this is nothing if you do not have a kind of a working consortium and these working consortia are national consortia and they exist in several countries uh, well in all of the member states we build a national infrastructure that is highly related to the infrastructure uh, of each of, of the other countries. So we have all of these countries and in the uh, past years we had the chance that uh, this, uh, this the number of members continuously grew. But we also have observers, uh, countries that could for one reason or another, in most cases, formally, uh, in the beginning of uh, uh, a membership, uh, decide to have a look at whether this is well, whether this is well, helpful, if it serves their purposes. We can start as an observer, and in uh, some cases, this observership uh, has been, uh, for essentially political reasons, uh, extended to. Uh, uh, for, for some time now, this is uh, specifically the case for the United Kingdom, but it is also possible to have third party uh, members or third party centers, especially for countries that can't become members for whatever reasons. And uh, for instance, in the US, we do have a um, center, uh, a third party center that is hosted at uh, CMU and uh, this contains a, val a valuable resource especially for data for child language acquisition. Whenever uh, a center, well, how to become a center? To become a center, it is important to uh, do some kind of certification process. So not everybody can become, not every center can become a clearing center. In the first step for the certification process, we need a kind of a certification, an external certification um, procedure for the data repository. In most cases, this is the uh, core trust seal, but possibly other certificates 
are possible. So if the technical structure of the technical repository has been certified according to the rules of this external um, uh, committee, then the Clarion Centers Committee, and I'm happy to welcome uh, uh, Martin Matisner, who is co-head of the Centers Committee here as well, uh, uh, pro uh, proposes a process uh, that makes uh, certification possible. And in the end, uh, the board of directors recommend uh, or um, uh, accept these centers. I think in the, the last say is always the, uh, the General Assembly. I'm not totally sure about uh, this process here, but with this, um, with this, certific with this certificate, uh, you can demonstrate that you are a center that fulfills certain requirements and since these centers since the situation in the centers can change over time this certificate has only a limited validity so uh, you start for well essentially uh, 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 the certification is valid for three years there are also case centers and i uh, display here uh, the case center for um, digitization, especially since many libraries are part of this case center, case center. For instance, also the Royal Library of the Netherlands, but also uh, some of us. Clarion is not an infrastructure that develops products, that develops in the strict sense resources. But we build an infrastructure, Clarion builds an infrastructure that allows to access resources that makes these resources interoperable and also in the first step to find these resources. And one of these uh, uh, ways to find these resources is the so-called virtual language observatory. Essentially, technically, we can have a Talk about we can talk about this a little bit later in more detail. But essentially, there's a harvesting procedure that harvests the metadata, the metadata of the centers, and then the harvested metadata are accessible via this VLO. And you can use these faceted search. You can choose a certain criteria, and you can find, you can search for the resources as at least according to the metadata given. <coughs> Clarion in this case allows or supports uh, the life cycle of data. So you can find wire data, then you can do whatever you like. For instance, you can mine the data, you can visualize the data, you can archive the data and the results of this analysis analyzers and all these processes can be the step, a new, a new stage for uh, a new run of the cycle. <coughs> Our resources are accessible through persistent identifiers. Uh, we have several, uh, uh, well, we especially support handles and also doors uh, and these um, Persistent identifiers are, well, it's mandatory, mandatory to have persistent identifiers associated with your resources. Well, for good reason. Uh, some examples of resources we have, uh, uh, and in this case, Corporan. And if you have these Corporan, you have this metadata, it might also be interesting to search not only for the metadata, but also in the content. And this is done by what we call federated content search. So we do not build a large hub where all the data is indexed, but we do allow for the um, yeah to for we build interfaces uh, that allow the centers to provide query functions for their data, and then uh, the results are collected and are shown in this as a result of the federated content search. This is still work in progress. It works but it is continuously further developed. Um, <clears throat> we have some specific topics. For instance, we deal with standards. Standards are important. I don't have to mention this here, but we uh, deal with uh, 
these standards. We we evaluate the standard the standards. We talk about the applicability of these standards for certain purposes. And there's also a standards committee within Clarin uh, that tries to organize um, the standards activities within Clarin and also to build a, an interface to the outside world, for instance, standards bodies. Legal issues are also a very important point, and there's also a legal issues committee. Uh, for instance, copyright, uh, database right, data protection rights are topics that are dealt with in Clarin. And the chair of the Legal Issues Committee, Pavel Kamotsky, is also here in the room. Uh, and uh, is also, I, I guess he's also, I'm, I'm certain that he's also happy to answer questions on, on these things. <laughs> and the last thing I would like to mention is some kind of dissemination and uh, uh, activities. Clarin runs a um, Clarin conference. The Clarin conference uh, exists since uh, some 10 years now, because Clarin exists since, since some 10 years now as an era. And uh, of course, the last two uh, annual conferences took place uh, virtually, but the other ones uh, took place in person. And there's also this Clarin annual conference in 2002 that is going to take place in Prague. And in this conference, we will have a specific topic uh, that also deals with Clarin and libraries. And one of the invited speakers of uh, the Clarin annual conference is Peter Leinen from the German National Library and who is going to talk, give a talk uh, later uh, today. Um, Franziska uh, mentioned that I should especially also point out the possibility uh, to that it is possible to, to apply for funding. So Clarin uh, tries to, in a way, help interesting initiatives to, um, yeah, to be in the position to, uh, uh, to, to develop new things, to uh, present their uh, activities. And there's a Clarin funding page, and this funding page uh, uh, gives you a very good start to check what kind of activities uh, can be funded. And Francisca is probably also happy to, uh, to answer questions on these things um, uh, later today. I start by briefly reintroducing myself. I'm Henny Brugman. I work for the uh, Humanities Cluster here in Amsterdam, which is a, uh, a group of three research organizations involved in uh, uh, linguistics, history, uh, literary sciences and social history. Uh, and I work as a, a, a software developer. Uh, that is, I do not do that much software development myself. I have a small team for that and we work on uh, uh, on software that's mainly involved with uh, text uh, textual collections. <clears throat> um, I was asked to say something about the Nederlab project that has been some time. So I took the opportunity to both look back on the last couple of years uh, and formulate some lessons that we learned uh, from these years. And then I'd like to give a, a brief uh, view to what we are uh, working now, uh, working on now and hope to be working on for the next couple of years. And hopefully based on what we learned uh, in our past. <clears throat> so the overview is, I'll first give a, a, a brief landscape of uh, the things we have worked on and uh, are working on. Uh, this, the, the talk has two main tracks, as I already said. So Nederlab is the first, the, the, which is a large project that ended some time ago and the lessons learned. Uh, the second part is on, uh, as a working title, uh, I uh, called it Online Annotatable Collections. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, then I'll uh, formulate some conclusions or maybe it's statements that are open for discussion. Uh, and on my final slide, I collected some issues and questions that I hope to discuss with you 
uh, and that still are uh, open questions for me as well. So the landscape. <coughs> uh, so we, we typically work at HUC with uh, text collections, text corpora, uh, collections from cultural heritage institutions, uh, research collections, and these collections are uh, in a range of different formats. Uh, sometimes hosted or provided by different uh, organizations, uh, so quite heterogeneous. So what we did in the Nederland project, uh, oh yeah, and these these resources typically contain text, which is often enriched in some way, and these resources are described with metadata. Uh, and we, what we did in Nederland is. Um, we took a, a kind of a unifying aggregation approach. So we took all these different, we took a couple of different resources and brought them to one form uh, for the text and rich textual uh, resources. Uh, this was a kind of pipeline where we converted to a format that's used a lot in the Netherlands, which is called Folia. And then the project did a lot of complex pre-processing on it, uh, adding enrichment to it, uh, minimally containing uh, uh, lemmas, part of speech tagging, and some uh, named entities that were recognized. On the other hand, the, the, the metadata, uh, we defined a kind of unifying uh, metadata scheme and converted for all these collections, we converted this metadata uh, uh, so that it confirmed to this scheme and then the, a lot of curation was done on it. Uh, sometimes manually, sometimes automatic curation and we did the uh, harmonization things like authors that were shared by multiple collections, we unified them, things like that. Uh, and then we took things together again, so the enriched texts and the converted metadata, and we did some complex indexing to make it uh, uh, searchable uh, in clever ways. And finally, uh, we built a, a research environment on top of that, mainly using the search engine. So that, that was roughly what we did in Nederland. Uh, what we are doing now is taking a bit different approach, starting from the, uh, these textual resources again. Uh, as a first step, uh, we do something that we gave the name, uh, the working title, Untangle. Uh, the T is for text, the A double N is for annotations. And this basically means uh, decompose the textual resources in a stream of raw text, uh, plus some coordinate system to refer to segments in these texts, uh, plus annotations. that can use the coordinates uh, in this text. So basically these annotations can point to any segment in the text. Uh, we heavily borrowed from IIIF and web annotations. So that's the form that we uh, 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 finally take before we publish it. And then there's the possibility to, uh, to develop annotation tooling on top of that. And this gives you uh, access to each individual text segment. Uh, and also there's a link to the GUI search and analysis. So, uh, so, and in fact, there could be an arrow from this here to the search engine. So in principle, this could also be indexed and searched. So these are different ways uh, to deal with textual resources. This I'll go to in a bit more detail in the, uh, other slides. So to go a bit more in depth to Nederlab. Uh, Nederlab was a, a large project with uh, very uh, ambitious aims. Uh, the, the, the main aim was, was uh, scholarly exploitation of historic Dutch text collections. And the proposal talked about everything published in the Netherlands. Uh, from as early as possible. So it was clear from the start that we were, that aim was not going to be reached. 
the main focus for this scholarly exploitation was the diachronic. So people wanted to be able to investigate how things in these in this immense text corpus how things change over time, how, thing, how things develop. And things could be historical concepts, but could also be linguistic constructs. This project is a couple of years in the past. It ended in 2018. Uh, so the status is what you sort of see a lot for these types of projects once the project status ends. Uh, we have for several reasons not been able to do a lot of software development and so continue on the software development. Uh, we have done collection updates, so we have added collections, we have added improved versions of collections, but nevertheless it's still used quite a lot by, uh, by researchers. Uh, uh, and it's also used for serious types of research like people doing systematic uh, querying of the system uh, uh, to support their thesis or so. Uh, some features and statistics. There are 20, currently 24 sub-collections in Nederland of a very different nature and very different size. So the uh, newspapers from the uh, KB uh, is by far the largest collection that's in Nederland. But there's also, there are also very small collections with uh, uh, exchanges of letters uh, in it, so historical collections. Uh, but also thematically, it's, it's quite different collections, and it's but it's, it's kind of nicely spreads over time. So it's from I think 13th century, 14th century uh, until present day. Uh, we have about a hundred different types of annotation layers added to the text. Uh, and resulting in, uh, OK, uh, and, and the, the, the number of words is, uh, is 19 billion. Uh, uh, and this results in about 100 billion automatically generated annotations. So it's substantial, large. Uh, as I described uh, already a little bit, it is query based. So the, the, the front end almost exclusively works by uh, querying the back end. And it can do qu quite complex searches. So you can f formulate complex queries, but also uh, you can retrieve your results in a number of different forms. So uh, Martin already showed the keyword in context, the concordances. This is probably the default way you get your results presented, but you can also have all kinds of aggregated results like statistics over the result set that you have, uh, all kinds of distributions like a distribution over time or over genres or over whatever. Uh, you can have frequency lists uh, over words, but also over other annotation layers. So you can frequency list over lemmas or part of speech, for example. Uh, and we have a historical lexicon in the background that can do uh, uh, query expansions uh, for you. And in fact, it's not on my slide, but uh, we have in this front end, we have a facility to deal with virtual collections. Uh, that's basically you can store uh, your queries as a personal collection and you can define exceptions on that. So you can exclude things from your query results or include additional things in your query results. Oh, some lessons learned. Uh, I already touched on this. It's a project and a project is not a service. And once a project ends, uh, the people involved are heavily involved in new projects. Uh, also in case of Nederland, people go away. These are typically people with a lot of expertise and clever ideas but also know-how that you need gets lost. Uh, updates cost a lot, so that's that's a difficulty and it's not, it's not unfamiliar to the audience, I'm sure. Problem is data quality. A lot of the material is OCR based. And if you look at that now, results can be a lot better than are now because OCR is better 
and risk detector recognition is better. The cleaning up text can be done better. The algorithms that we use to enrich uh, the text, they get better. So there's, if you look at the data quality, it's, it's sort of outdated now. Uh, an issue is, especially for the collection providers, it is, it was and is, still is, uh, and it was already mentioned here just before, that collection providers, uh, they give their material uh, very willingly, but they would like to have the enrichments and results and improvements, they want to have that back. And that is often very problematic. Uh, because of all these conversions that the uh, curations and so that I showed. There's rights issues. Uh, we see in the meantime, we see an increase, increasing demand for access over APIs. People not exclusively want to use uh, an interactive, graf uh, interactive graphical user interface. And the user interface by itself, it was never finished. There were also uh, there was a pile of wishes that uh, were never met, uh, and it quickly gets outdated. And uh, people simply want different things. So, uh, graphical user interfaces. Okay, I'll speed up a bit. <laughs> uh, and there's uh, there's an issue that the resources that we have are not always at the right level of segmentation. So, for example. For the newspapers, we have a segmentation in articles, but sometimes we have bundles of letters and we want to be able to access individual letters as resources and we only have the bundle. <coughs> okay, now about the, the new approach. What we try to do now is more in line with uh, linked open data ideas. We are shifting the focus from virtual research environments uh, more to online accessible data. Uh, so we want more of the stuff that we put in uh, user interfaces to be part of clever backends. And what we have in mind is very annotation centered. Because uh, as an as observation, a lot of the material that we have consists of annotations on text. Each enrichment can be an entity, uh, but also document structure can be considered an annotation on a stream of text. Uh, another observation is that sets of annotations can be very valuable and are uh, first class data uh, that uh, uh, also can be owned by a researcher by themselves. Uh, so it's, it can be very valuable. Uh, to have sets of annotations. So what uh, what we have in mind is a sort of uh, text collection online uh, with a cloud of annotations around that. Uh, and these annotations can be added by the collection providers, can be part of your collection, but also in the same cloud, uh, you can have annotations by the users, by the, uh, the scholars that add enrichment to the collection. And we want to treat them in exactly the same way. Uh, and of course, we want this to be standards based. And Neil already mentioned the obvious standards are IIIF uh, in combination with web, web annotations. Important for this to work is that there has to be things done by the providers of the collections. Uh, they have to make the te their textual resources online available in such a way that they can be easily annotated. And that requires, this may require substantial pre-processing on their part and resources that are involved. So to find out if this is all feasible, we uh, experiments are needed. Uh, and we are actually doing at this moment, we are at, at the stage that we are doing sort of real life uh, 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 experiments. I think I have to speed up a bit. Yeah, yeah the one minute remaining. Okay. Check. I'm not going to into detail. So what is on this slide in two sentences is 
on the left, I explain the idea of triple IF, where there's kind of a canvas abstraction between the images and the annotations that you add to these images. And this is the analog for text that we are working on. So we want to split uh, documents in text plus annotations. Uh, and then we want uh, an analogous to uh, a canvas for images. We want to have a kind of a text canvas uh, that we can use for text. And the idea being that you can use a simple URL to, on this side, retrieve uh, an image fragment, and you can use a text URL to retrieve uh, a text segment, any text segment from your corpus. This is a kind of a small client that we built uh, as a proof of concept. Uh, this is one annotation. It is a, what it shows is a, a rendering of one web annotation that stands for logical unit. This is a resolution uh, of the Dutch Parliament uh, in some of, in, in one of our collections. Um, what it shows is uh, image image uh, segments retrieved by uh, image triple IF and text segments that are uh, retrieved by a service that we uh, developed that does this triple IF for text idea. So basically this is a visualization of one web annotation. Okay. This is, uh, this is this is a brief summary of the, the projects that we apply this on and the components that we develop. I'll skip this, but I would be glad to discuss this in a uh, smaller session of in a, a separate session section. Um, some conclusions. I think the, the two approaches that uh, that I presented uh, both are good approaches and have their, their benefits and are not exclusive. So they, they, I see them as quite compl complementary. Um, I think we should invest more in uh, making the data accessible in advanced ways and less in front ends and search engines because it had, has large benefits to do so. It's, it's a lot cheaper. Uh, it gives uh, more autonomy to the users. Users can easily retrieve text and do their own things on text and add things to the text. Uh, I think it is a more sustainable and reusable solution. So it's 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 better uh, uh, a, a better and a cheaper investment uh, that lasts longer. Um, I think that annotations are. Uh, perfect glue between collection also between and also inside collections. So I think this annotation metaphor is quite powerful. Um, and I think annotations can also be quite valuable. Uh, uh, sets of annotations can be very valuable uh, for collection providers as well, because they can take back these sets of annotations quite easily because to start with, they already refer to their own uh, uh, online collections. Um, there's a, a list of uh, uh, a, a revisited list of uh, Nederlab issues. Uh, I won't go through it for time's sake, but uh, for all of these issues, this new approach has some benefits. Final slide is my open issues. Um, so where my own doubts are. So how well how well does this all scale? So I, I mentioned web annotations, and I went, mentioned on the other side, 100 billion annotations. That's there's a gap. There's a challenge. Uh, I also uh, mentioned um, uh, a stream of text. This is a, a large simplification. So if you have complex textual documents, they are not linear. So that, this may break somewhere. This idea versioning and uh, uh, going back to the original formats, like, like complex formats like TEI, that, that's a complex issue. The key point and we, for all of this, this online uh, annotatable collections is persistence. So if everybody works by referring to a published stream of text, 
uh, you have to make sure that these references are persistent, that your annotations don't break because the uh, the collections uh, are not persistently uh, published. And this idea of is very dependent on the willingness and the, the cost benefit analysis of the collection uh, collection providers. Is there enough value in this idea uh, for collection providers to try this out and to uh, to apply this? Okay, um, we have a we have a long discussion in in Germany on on building up a a research or an infrastructure in. Uh, an information infrastructure or an, a, a um, research infrastructure starting almost uh, 10 years ago. We have a commission um, which uh, came up with a with a first paper um, on dealing with building up a information infrastructure for researchers in, in Germany um, coming up in 2016. With a with a second paper on another committee, um, telling a little bit about performance through diversity, uh, so to speak, uh, we should have a very distributed infrastructure system in Germany, and every and each organization should bring their their benefits into this into this network. Um, in, to, in 2018, um, the Joint Science Conference in, in Germany decided to build up this national research infrastructure. Um, sorry, the abbreviations are always uh, in Germany. You have to deal with uh, within the next slide on this uh, research, national research data infrastructure as Nationale Forschungsdaten Infrastruktur, how it is called in Germany. Um, so this is, is one of the of the starting point of this initiative. Um, the goal is to develop a um, and long time preservation of data holdings, but also developing some services for this data. Um, it's not explicit, uh, explicitly told us about uh, along the FAIR principles um, with out disciplinary and national boundaries. National boundaries is a little bit different, difficult, and there should be up to 30 consortia um, of over, over all the, the disciplines we have in, in, in the research communities. Um, and it should be a process where the consortia formed itself. So there's no process telling us this consortia, this consortia, this consortia, but it should be a self science driven process um, and there should be a, a strong connection between um, this different consortia. The interlinking of this consortia um, is going on on different levels, uh, so to speak. We have a memorandum, a memorandum, memorandum of understanding by the humanities and cultural science we have the Leipzig Berlin statement on, on cross cutting topics. This is very important, but not just, just at, the, at the end of the discussion. And there will be an NFDI, or there is an NFDI association, also with some working groups where we should meet all of this in the consortium. Now I will switch to the text plus again uh, after this short intro introduction. And will focus on on text plus on a well on a, on a rough level, not going into any details because of of the time. Um, the, the, the aim is to build up a research data infrastructure, focus on language and text textual data. The communities I have listed here for completeness. There's a, a huge community behind this this uh, data types already uh, present in in Daria and in Clarin. The text community um, has formulated has formulated the needs and the expect, expectation or the interest. Um, we should have support in the creation of standard compliant research data. Standard compliant is one of the big issues. Make it interoperable. We have the long term pro pro provision of research data um, after the end of the project. We have heard it just 
just before. Um, the guidance or support on the use of relevant data and tools. Um, we have this legal and ethical issues using the data. Very, very hard job in, in Germany. Um, and consulting and planning of, res of research data management plans and implementing of research projects. What is of the of text plus is a Leibniz Institute for the German language as the applicant institution. And we have uh, four co applicant institutions, namely the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science and Humanities. We have the German National Library. We have the Göttingen State and University Library. You see, you may count the libraries in, in this in this body list. Um, and we have the another Academy of Science, Humanities and the Arts in what is it, Köln or Düsseldorf? Uh, well, well, any, formerly, anyway. Formerly in Düsseldorf, but... Uh, really in Köln, yes. Really in Köln. <laughs> it, Köln that, it, can't, it can't work uh, <laughs> between these two cities in Germany. So, but there are a lot of more participants within these, in this uh, consortia, and if you count it um, right away, you should end up with, uh, the, with the number of 34 organizations within this project. That's a huge project, and you may imagine we have a proper administration. We have some some committees needed. Not going into the detail on the on the organization of this huge project, but on the structure of the project, which which might might help also. The body of the text has a strong connection to TextGrid. To start with, we have Clarin D, we have Daria DE. And we have the common project Claria D. And again, my history missed my history is a little bit on Text Plus being the head of the computer center at Trier um, and Daria, and afterwards to Claria. And nowadays I have to do with all this with all this force. <clears throat> Community involvement is one of the big um, jobs we have to do. We have 120 user stories. We asked the researchers to describe some projects, some needs, some tools, some needs for tools, some ideas. We have some workshops. We have 20 professional associations in Germany. Um, and again, uh, this is a huge uh, amount of people and, and interested interests in incorporating in Text Plus. Um, they are the professional associations are mainly in the represented in the so-called scientific board, but also in the scientific uh, coordination committees uh, coming later to this to describe what what it, uh, where it is and at that point. Um, one of the big issues we have as a, on a, on the top level structure is we have three data domains um, which are uh, collections, lexical resources, and editions. And we try to interconnect these three uh, data domains by themselves. Collections might be the basis for some editions or lexical resources might be used for annotation of collections. So there is a, an interconnect between these three data domains. And we have a fourth um, structure part of the project. This is infrastructure operation, which dealing deals with uh, cross-cutting topics. Also the operation part, but the infrastructure part, um, namely authority files um, will be handled in all these three data domains. And we, we decided to put it on, into the infrastructure. Um, the measures of the of all these data domains are following the same the same ideas. We have the reference implementation, coming back to this in a minute, portfolio development. So we start here at the starting point, but there should be more data incorporated in the text plus. Standardization activities, community activities, and software services. Standardization activities is dealing also with some, some legal and ethical aspects. Community activities are workshops, uh, transfer of of know-how, know-how transfer, and software services. For example, in in the in the part of collection, we have the idea 
to build up some processing queues to get access also to copyright protected material uh, in a distributed manner. So um, I'm always telling if the data can't go to the software, the software has to go to the data. Um, we wait and see what's what's going on there. Going into some rough details of this three data um, parts, the collection is or all these are divided or organized by some some clusters we have in the collections. We have the content for a language, which is leaded by the uh, Institute for, for the German language. We have the historical text, which is led by the Berlin Brandenburg Academy of Science. And we have the unstructured text, and that's the point where the libraries comes in. This is a common, common lead with the, with the University Library of Göttingen and the German National Library. Unstructured text in the sense there is no, or the structure of the text is only implicitly given at that point. In the contemporary language, we use also the concept of the data centers, or we use the, the concept of the data centers we have seen already. And in the contemporary language, um, a lot of um, certified data centers from, from the Clarin, Clarin context are, are available. And in this collections, we have already nearly 20 participating institutions. Um, to some extent split it up into these three clusters, but this is also a, a huge uh, organization topic we have to deal with. What are build up collections? We have the text collections, we have uh, multimodal um, recordings, mono and multimodal recordings, but we have also some sensor data or some data from, from interviews, um, which is not only speech or not only text but also something in between and we try to also to collect some text collections with with uh, the recordings uh, and use uh, try to to uh, develop some some common tools for that um, the first step is the data ingest have in mind we have a distributed infrastructure system so data ingest means we have a common search interface, and we have heard it already um, in the beginning. This is uh, more or less a federated content search and the search over the distributed metadata. Um, integration of new software services is one of the, the first steps and workshops on data curation, legal issues, um, and other things. Um, what we promised to the community that we will give a support for all or almost all uh, issues regarding collections there might be some technical but also some some uh, ethical or some legal aspects in using collections um, we integrate collections on a scale not yet present, not yet used, not yet uh, usable by the researchers, um, and we increase the standardization and interoperability for collections in by linked open data, for example, for by authority fields. A short, some sort, short um, information on, on the other two uh, uh, data um, domains we have some the, in the lexical resources we have some some clusters also okay also driven by by some of the of the um, in the distributed way on by by the by some of the uh, participation uh, participants uh, the German dictionary in the European context we have some non latin scripts also on board which show the broadens of the editions of the lecture resource we have, we have here. And you may imagine this is uh, in, a, in a broad sense, dictionaries, authority files, ontologies, uh, what you can ever imagine behind lexical resources. Um, also, the first step is to 
build a virtual system of all this distributed in information um, in the lexical resources. And one of the special things in the lexical resources is to integrate all these resources in the so-called lexical linked open data cloud, which may make it useful for uh, for other topics um, and make it findable in a, in a virtual common sense. Additions also um, two clusters here, um, mainly split on on the on the time span. We are looking for um, example, typical example we we know this is, are the historical critical editions, but also we have some some other one. And again, uh, the first step is is to build up a common view on on all this difference and to have a common a common home for all these editions we have in, in German in the research community. Let me switch for uh, two slides for the infrastructure. Um, it is built up as an info in interface to the to the three data domains. Um, and I will focus you on, on this uh, topic. This is one of the of the part of, of text plus well, which a huge interchange, interchange exchange uh, to the NFDE at, at large, which is consists up to to 30 uh, consortia if we are finished uh, this year. Um, so there is also a lot of, of um, uh, exchange between between the, the consortia. With that. We have the, the MOU I mentioned already from the humanities and the cultural studies. Uh, there are some, some common topics starting with metadata standards with metadata uh, authority files, but also provenance, rights and ethics and, and also data literacy. These are the, the topics we have with this. Hopefully four uh, consortia. Two of them are um, running. Um, this is um, NFD for culture starting in 2020. 20. 20. Um, the other one is Text Plus starting in October last year. And the NFDE for object and the NFDE for memory is uh, just in, in progress of um, evaluation. Hopefully, we have at the end four uh, class for community, uh, no, for. Um, Consortia, thank you for consortia with, with this in this context. Um, and we have, in addition, some cross cuttings with all within the complete, within the, in the large NFTI standards for text and language based authority data, but also some technical infrastructure like PID or an authority and um, as an, an AI, AI, AI authority. No. Uh, uh, infrastructure. In, infrastructure is to sure uh, access and authorization and authentication. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Um, yes, and we are connected to a to a broad initi initiatives uh, like Clarin, like Daria, but also like the German Digital Library, Europeana, or other research, the Open uh, Air. Uh, the EOSC, although there is a, a broad connection also um, outside the NFDI. Uh, let me start with one specific topic as we are talking about uh, Clarin and library. Let me let me show the role of the library or the special uh, the national library. Uh, we took the, the co-application, um, so we are one of the five bodies. Um, it is my pleasure to be the task area lead for collections. This, uh, you know, this 29 organizations I have uh, to deal with. Um, and we also, uh, I mentioned already, have to deal with this cluster unstructured text. Uh, the topics, uh, we have a huge digital collections, born digital and starting now with also with digitized materials. The knowledge on standards on metadata standards and object standards is, is available. We, we bring this with into the 
consortium, we have the authority file, which is one of the big, of the big advantage to have a library on, like the German National Library on, on board, uh, linked open data technologies. Legal and ethical aspects is also a valid uh, uh, benefit we bring in, and all our knowledge about long-term preservation is the next. And as a library, I guess, we are a guarantee for sustainability. At least we have to make a contract on that uh, before we get any money. So I guess that's what I would like to talk about. Data services at KB, a short story. Uh, 10 years ago, we started this service. I was at that point a data services coordinator. So I'll present you a few of the slides that I used when we already eight, nine, ten years ago uh, to explain what we were doing. Um, we were in the process of digitizing everything. We started in the 80s with uh, digitizing all of the metadata, but bibliographical metadata. By the 90s, we started uh, digitizing the eye candy, putting this online. Uh, then we had a mass digitization project at the start of this century. Uh, this is the earliest uh, surviving uh, Dutch newspaper. It's in uh, uh, Stockholm at the KB, but we now have a digital copy. And with uh, mass digitization came the OCR or even corrected OCR. So we have uh, machine readable text and with mass digitization also came extra metadata. So all of this is data we wanted to give access to to researchers and that was data services. So more than 200 years of collecting, 30 years of digitization, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, maybe point to this one, legally as open as possible, means that for us, if there's no longer any copyright, this means that it's in the public domain, all for metadata is CC0. And we were in very fortunate uh, already nine or 10 years ago that we have been able to negotiate uh, uh, contracts with publishers and collective management organizations to be able to give access to also 20th century digitized material, newspapers, uh, magazines, even books, um, <clears throat> not all of them, um, but for instance, for, especially for newspapers, we were able to give access to the newspapers up until 1995 for research purposes and publish them online on our um, uh, search interface we have called Delphi. Uh, Delphi wasn't there at that time. Anyway, we were able to do that. Um, so that was the data. Um, and we were also very fortunate at that time that um, it was already, most of these collections were already a rather open infrastructure. So there was an OAI PMH API available and SRU API available. So that made it technically quite easy to start giving access to researchers. <clears throat> so started with a uh, web page on the KB website called data services and APIs. Um, and then we added a few other things, um, a few other options in the following years. Like I say over here, in no particular order, um, for the newspapers that were in the public domain, we created zip files because we've already found out that this OAI P, um, API was quite difficult, especially for people that can't code or do some scripting. So. We published a few zip files. Um, we also launched in 2014 our lab, and the lab was the start of derived data sets. This is an example. This is, well, Matein can explain everything about That's how we met. He came in as a researcher in residence and wanted to have all of the uh, photographs and et cetera that are, were published in all of these uh, historical newspapers and have this as a separate data set. So that's what we did. That's a derived data set there. Um, we also started publishing some of the smaller collections on Wiki Commons. Uh, we have one colleague who is uh, really keen on doing that, so he keeps on publishing every year a few of those smaller collections. Um, a few years ago, we started publishing the, most of the, some of the metadata, I should say, in linked open data format. This is data at Bibliotheken, it's libraries. Um, we didn't publish that much, but uh, within the next year or two, we will publish a few more. We we'll finally have a, a new colleague working on this. Um, so 
That's it. All of this resulted in few, well, I should say, uh, quite few uh, humanities research projects uh, and also uh, some research tools and environments. These are just a few logos and icons from, from some of those uh, research uh, projects that have been based mostly on the historical newspapers that we digitized. Um, but researchers also built their own online tools. This one was one of the earliest. Was, I think it's already eight or nine years old now. It's an engram viewer built on top of uh, our historical newspapers. Uh, as you can see, 1995. Um, <clears throat> Nederlap, you didn't show it, but that's uh, <laughs> the online presence of Nederlap. That was what Henny was talking about. Uh, another one that has been built at the Sound and Vision uh, Institute together within the Claria, Clara, it's Claria in, for us, um, infrastructure. It's mostly, uh, it's called Media Suite. It's about giving access and uh, analyzing audiovisual materials, but, all, but again, uh, our newspapers are also in there. Um, and then another example is from the Digital Humanities Lab at Utrecht University, where they have built this small tool and this ingested all of our historical newspapers, but also some of the newspapers. I think it's from Gale. Uh, so to compare um, um, Dutch and English um, news, historical news and analyze it. Now, today, data service at KB, KB, what is missing? I'm just going to highlight, I think, three or four uh, things. First of all, this is taken from a tweet from Benjamin Schmidt from two or three weeks ago, I think. Uh, this is this really specific point I already mentioned where an API could be quite difficult for a lot of people. For instance, uh, somebody who can't code, who can't script, that could be really uh, time consuming. Also means that we, as a library have to uh, give a lot of assistance. On the other hand, we also have um, some of the bigger data driven uh, projects who say that our API is really, really <laughs> um, difficult, meaning that it, it takes them a few weeks or even months to get the whole collections, to, to, to harvest a, a whole collection. So we know we have an API, but it's probably not enough. We already know this for quite a few years. Secondly, um, I already showed this slide that I used 10 years ago. And at that point, there was also, also this one in there, 10 years of collecting born digital, uh, 10 plus years of collecting born digital publications. That was a promise, but we're still not able to give access to these born digital collections for research purposes, not even for research purposes because of copyright issues. Big issue. So can we find a way to provide access to these uh, collections? And thirdly, we saw Nederlop, I analyze the media suite, but also there are some other initiatives uh, internationally uh, where people are trying to find a way in between the traditional search engine and giving access to an API, trying to give uh, um, a wider range of people the, the tools to analyze uh, these kinds of collections on a, on a bigger scale. So can we break, bridge the gap between simple search GUIs and advanced functionalities for text analysis? These are the, the questions. Um, and I try to summarize them like this. <laughs> um, we've got the API is the road. If you want all of the data, the road is too small, so that's making that's really a big problem. If you can't code, the you, it's impossible to use the code. If it's in copyright, we have a big problem. And maybe we should find a way to create interfaces for those people who need uh, who can't code themselves and give them some more assistance, bring the, the data to them. So, the future towards data services 2.0. What are we working on or planning to work on? Uh, first of all, and this really echoes what Henny was saying, invest more in accessible data. So we published internally within the KBE FAIR manifesto 
we want to have our data be more findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable. It was also in your slides, and the fire principles should be in the core of how we treat our data. Um, this is also uh, the way, this is also why we are working on machine readable descriptions of the different collections we have, so it can become part of the Claria Fair dataset register. This is also why we uh, only one month ago, I think it was, uh, agreed with Henny that we would like to join his experiment on working on uh, IIIF for text, because you'd like to have um, all of your data on a really granular, granular level and on the highest level, uh, annotatable, uh, citable, etc. Secondly, oh, and on the top right, I tried to say what is this, what is this solving or not. Anyway, uh, we have a colleague working on a few very simple notebooks. That could be a first start for people who can't code. Could be a very simple uh, entry point to our data sets. Um, sec thirdly, um, last week we had a kickoff for our text and data mining room, which should be within the library. Uh, and the text and data mining room is one of the ways we, we are allowed to give access to our in copyright material within uh, the KB. So this is what we are, uh, have to want to set up, really a special room dedicated with dedicated service, maybe um, virtual machines to run there. So people can, researchers can come in and really do some text mining on our copyright material. Getting more excited. Software to the software to data. You already mentioned this. We have a, a very small uh, proof of concept developed together within the Claria context, by the way, uh, to try and it's uh, more or less. Um, inspired. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, inspired by the Hattie Trust data capsules, uh, trying if it is possible to work out a way to, to have a secure research environment where people can load up their algorithm, run it on our data, and then get the uh, results back. And it's working. This is it. That's the only thing I can show you at the moment. I mean, <laughs> we know it's working, and uh, there's already uh, Again, only a few weeks ago, we started a, a, a huge project. It's called a SANE project, which is together with Claria and Odyssey. Odyssey are the social sciences, it's the national social sciences uh, infrastructure in the Netherlands. So, all, so this is SSH in the Netherlands. And this consortium will work on a, not really a proof of concept, but really a working solution for this problem. Or oh, it's not a problem, it's a solution. Yeah, anyway. Um, so that's the tools to data, uh, mostly for the in copyright material. And then lastly, this and this needs some introduction. Uh, we commissioned a uh, research and uh, consultancy for, for firm, Dialogic, to do some research on whether there is really a room for this kind of user interface where uh, researchers, but also non-academics, can um, interact with all of the collections, analyze these collections, uh, do, do have the the um, affordances of NLP, etc., to to, uh, to use it within their research or just for fun, whatever. We will publish this report in a few weeks, um, but I can show you the main probably I think recommendation is again echoes in a way what Henny was saying don't invest too much in front ends invest more in accessible data you can read it for yourself it says yes there is room for a text read as long as you position this as a some kind of corpus or maybe collection selection tool and this again means that you can, we can use all of the techniques from NLP, from machine learning, from AI, whatever, but not for analysis within research, but really for the, the selection and discovery of collections. Uh, that's more or less the main point. Am I? Yeah. Um, the main point. So 
we decided that we are going to um, develop a corpus selection tool within, I think it will be next year probably. Uh, and what it really is, we still don't know. And I, but I also hope because um, this one is still a difficult one to fix. But I do hope we we will be able to fix the idea. Uh, this corpus selection tool will be uh, able to fix that problem too, if that makes sense. Uh, if you're interested, D.H. Benelux, second day. Max Kemen, the main author of the report, and I will present the report uh, in Luxembourg. So good morning, everybody. I get the morning waking up slot for everybody. So I hope everyone had such a lovely dinner last night. I hope I can sort of um, waken everybody up this morning. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Data KBRBE project, um, which is led by the KBR, the Royal Library of Belgium, and particularly looking at uh, data level access, in this case, to digitise collections for digital humanities research. But I'm going to sort of take it broader, so um, sort of look more at the collections as data initiatives, um, talk a little bit about the European Open Science Cloud. So I added a couple of slides after our discussions yesterday and particularly the potentially the role of libraries. And even I added one slide on HPC. So let's see how this 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 goes. So before I start, before we talked about it yesterday, how many people knew about this collections as data initiative already? Is it something that was familiar? So about three people maybe. Uh, so that's four, five. That's good. So um, I thought I'd start with a little bit about that. Um, so there were two projects and I think the second one is coming to an end now. Um, the first one, uh, Collections as Data, always uh, already consultational and here they're very good in terms of open science and open access. So the final report is available here and also all the deliverable, deliverables from the project as well. So uh, Thomas Padilla and colleagues, um, they had the first project uh, project here, um, which was really looking at the sort of the cultural change needed uh, in libraries to think about how to deliver um, collections, whether it be digitized, born digital collections as data for uh, research. And I'm particularly interested in digital humanities research. Then they had a second um, phase and uh, the first phase was funded by, I think, the museums and libraries um, funding agency uh, in, in the North America. And then the second phase was funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. And this was really looking at the implementation of collections as data. So changing the culture in the first part and here. They had a number of cohorts where you had to put together a team of a, a library member of library staff, somebody with a senior um, sort of decision making powers, somebody from the research community and also somebody from computer science. And here this is just one of the examples of one of the articles that came out of these cohorts um, as well to see, OK, how can we turn uh, theory into practice? So if you haven't um, already have a look at it. It's maybe interesting and I think I will come back to this at the end and Stephen organized a, a research cafe which I will talk about at the end. But these two projects are coming to an end and I think a maybe in Europe there's not a lot of uh, not enough work going on in the collections as data. I'll give some examples, but how can we keep moving it forward? So I just want to give uh, two or three examples. So this is the one that really inspired me um, from the beginning. So this is newspapers as data. So this is the National Library of Luxembourg and they have an open data portal. And if you go down there, you can see all lots of information about their digitized historical newspapers. But what I really love about this is they've got kind of data pack, so a bit like a mobile phone uh, data pack. So here they have the starter pack of five days of news, 250 megabytes of data that you can download directly from their site, 
or if you're interested in a bit more kind of like text analysis, they also have the text analysis pack. And each time I look at this website, um, the, the data sets are growing. So um, maybe a, an interesting one to look at. The second one I'd like to share with you is the National Library of Scotland, and they come up with something called a data foundry, which is kind of is a bit more of an elaborate website. Um, and Sarah Ames, who is sort of leading that, she's written a number of articles um, on this. And here is one of the ones she's written in the Libra quarterly. And here in the data foundry, you can have digit data, digitized collections as data. They also have metadata collections as data, um, maps and geospatial data, and also, which I find incredibly interesting in a nerdy kind of way, um, administrative data about the library itself um, as data as well. So uh, quite interesting. One, they've got three core values, so open, transparent and practical and what i really like about the data foundry is if you go onto one of the pages they can say we've cleaned up the ocr we've got so many different files this is so many different characters in text um, and the other thing to point out is they've got a kind of publication plan so a sort of a roadmap of what um, collections they're going to publish as open data so I find this incredibly interesting. So maybe have a have a look at this. And the third one uh, I want to mention is one of the cohorts. So I gate crashed one of the international collections as data um, uh, webinars, which was great. And um, this was one of the favorite examples that I had. So this is the digital library or it's known as DLOC, the Digital Library of the Caribbean as data. And here they've got a wonderful collection of digitized newspapers um, from the Caribbean. And it's all been set up in a dataverse repository. So you can you probably can't see here, but you've got all the different files. They've got information about how many downloads uh, and that um, and kind of thing. So I find it really interesting as a way of displaying uh, digitized newspapers data and specifically for this audience I wonder could we see the Clarin resource families that um, I think uh, Andreas mentioned in the uh, on in his slides early on as a way of thinking about collections as data so for example you've got um, the newspaper corpora in here in the Clarin resource families and they're available for download and use so in some ways I think that Clarin resource families are already uh, an instance of collections as data. So now I want to sort of um, dive a little bit deeper into what we're doing at uh, KBR, the Royal Library of Belgium. So the project, it was a kind of 24 month project, but because I can only work half time on it, we've got it now over four years, which is excellent because it gives us a little bit more time because I think these collections as data initiatives take time to sort of change the culture, but then create the data infrastructure that is needed. So we're for facilitating data level access. So that's how I, I term in collections as data um, to the digitized and born digital collections for digital digital humanities research. Um, so here this is um, that we're using collections as data, and I think it was also mentioned several times yesterday. It's all about making the data openly uh, available as fair data as well. Um, and here on the right, you can see what that looks like. But if I go into a little bit more detail, so we have Belgica Press, which is the portal of um, digitized historical newspapers um, at the Royal Library of Belgium. And then we've got kind of two projects uh, working on this simultaneously. So we have the Data KBR project that I'm looking after, which um, facilitates the access to the data. And then we've got uh, Julie Burkholtz's lab. This is the digital research lab, and that is helping researchers to actually use and analyze the data. So it's kind of meant to be the whole workflow. And here, what we want to do is move beyond. So uh, Belgica Press is an amazing portal where you can search through the full text of around 120 titles um, of uh, Belgian digitized newspapers. But what we want to do is 
sort of turn it inside out and provide access to the underlying data. So here we've got Le Purple, and you can see uh, this is what it looks like underneath. So you've got the XML files, you've got the METS metadata, you've got the PDFs, and you've also got the TIFFs. So this is kind of like the data package that is under each single page of newspapers in, in Belgica Press. So that's what we want to do, turn it inside out and provide access to it. So a colleague of mine, uh, Gustavo Candela from the University of Alicante, he's um, been actively involved in the International Glam Labs um, uh, community, and I'll say a little bit more about that uh, later. But he, um, together with his colleagues in Alicante, tried to develop a methodology of how you might provide collections as data. So here, I don't know if you can see this, but at the top, you've got the digital collection, for example, the uh, digitized newspapers. Then you decide what parts of the collection you want. So this is the identification process. You access and retrieve that data. You may have to clean that data and reformat it. And then you can also do data enrichment, like I think Henny talked about yesterday. So what we want to do um, is kind of take this um, theoretical me methodology and see if it can be um, applied to the Belgian context. However, I think we talked a little bit about this uh, yesterday and I think it's, it's very interesting. So I'm sitting in a room of many uh, computational, linguist uh, computational linguists as well. Um, as well as librarians. So are we talking about collections, such as the collection of the Royal Library of Belgium, or are we talking about corpora? So a researcher who is interested in the history of Belgian journalism, he or she wants access um, to um, some of the data of the overall collection. And which comes first? If you're a librarian, the collections may come first, but if you're a researcher, the corpus comes first. And I think this was uh, something that Steven said in his presentation yesterday as well. We need some kind of platform in order to start making these corpora. And I'll come back to that again later. Um, this, um, I haven't actually read it yet, but it's, it's on my reading list for quite a while. But I don't know if some of you will know Barbara McGillivray. She comes from more from the linguistic side, but now she's been um, uh, appointed as Professor of Digital Humanities. And she discusses in this article sort of, well, I like to think of when is a corpus a corpus? and sort of looks at the differences between a, a NLP, a natural language processing, a kind of computational uh, linguistic corpus, or as digital humanities and what kind of the differences are in those. And I think this is something that this group is ideally um, uh, placed to explore um, of, of how we might think of collections and corpora and corpora from a say a Clarin perspective and corpora from a Daria perspective, the more digital humanities. So back to the uh, collections as data uh, methodology from uh, Gustavo Candela and his colleagues at Alicante. So in order to do this, um, we wanted to try and see if we can apply um, this methodology. Um, in the Data KBR project, we didn't want to do anything in a vacuum. So we wanted to make sure that we were working together with digital humanities researchers to make sure that um, we are meeting their needs as well. So on the left hand side of here, um, we've got something called research scenarios and I'll go to it, into it in a little bit more detail. But these are the scenarios or the research questions, the actual uh, digital humanities researchers want um, to uh, answer. And then we've got the digital collection. In this case, it's the digitized newspapers. So going into a little bit more detail. So we've got, we originally had two and then another one came along. Uh, so we've got three interdisciplinary research scenarios. The first one is Collective Action Belgium, and that's led by the centre, one of the centres I work, the Ghent Centre for Digital Humanities. And that is a social history scenario, and it's looking at um, forms of collective action, such as demonstrations, protests, strikes and everything, as they were represented in uh, the, the newspaper collections. 
The second one uh, is led by uh, um, the uh, Antwerp Centre for Digital Humanities, and ACDC is the best acronym for a digital <laughs> humanities centre ever. Um, this is the Feuilleton in Belgium, and looking at um, how um, novels in the first uh, 100 years of the Belgian uh, um, uh, no, I was going to say empire, that's not the right word, um, <laughs> nation state, um, uh, were published. So between 1830 and 1930, and looking at the first hundred years of um, Belgian literature as published in the digitised newspapers. And the third one is with the ULB, um, which is the French speaking university in Brussels, and that's looking at the history of Belgian journalism. So they're particularly they have a dictionary of uh, Belgian journalists that was published around uh, 20 years ago. And what they want to do is enrich that and ideally try to link the articles in the newspapers to the original uh, journalist that wrote them. So these are the kind of three scenarios that we are, are, let's say, validation that we're doing collections as data in a way that the researchers need. Then comes the difficult bit, um, and I was quite amazed how long this took and how much discussion it took. So we've got the corpus, uh, no, the collection of be digitised Belgian newspapers, and then we needed to sort of decide which parts of that we wanted to extract from the overall collection. So this example is from the first um, scenario, the Collective Action Belgium. So they were interested in the strikes. So we thought, well, how do we sort of look at the collection in order to decide what to extract? And here, um, this is a Wikipedia page, but um, it was the only sort of source that I could find online, which lists um, uh, the series of uh, general strikes that happened in Belgium from around 1893 onwards. So here are the various different strike years, when the strikes took place and why, why people were striking, for example. On the top right hand corner, um, you can see the table. So um, here, one of the things we wanted to do was um, we wanted to have a um, representative corpus from both um, Dutch language newspapers and French language newspapers. And we also wanted to, we've got something called the pillarization, um, very much like the Netherlands, but uh, in Belgium as well. So we have, for example, the socialist newspapers, the Catholic newspapers or the liberal newspapers. We wanted to make sure that we, if we had a socialist Dutch language newspaper, we had the socialist French language newspaper as a sort of comparison. Here across the top, these are the different strike years and the green and apologies, it says yes, I think it says yes and green um, for those that have been digitized and no and red um, for those who haven't been digitized. And here you can see that 1913, which was very nice, and um, this was also um, um, the year of the World Fair in Ghent, and this is one of the scenarios done uh, undertaken by the researchers in Ghent. So you can see all of those newspapers had been digitised for 1913. So this was a good basis to start extracting. I think this is very interesting and we can come back to this at the end, but I think we need to be more transparent and kind of document this uh, corpus making process. I mean, this was the first time we did it, so we had to kind of make it up as we go along. But if we can kind of document this process um, in order to say what decisions we made, why did we put this corpus together? I think this is part of the whole uh, research data management life cycle. So, um, and at the moment, we don't have APIs or to access the data, so this is a relatively manual process. So we did um, this kind of exercise with each of the three scenarios. So in the end, for the first data extraction, so within the project, we we're allowed to do three data extractions. We came out with 12 newspaper titles. Um, three years, so I just talked about the 1913 for the Collective Action Belgium. 
Um, we did 1885 for the Feuilleton in Belgium. This is the literary supplements because they kind of stabilized by then and there were they were published in each of the six titles. And then 1950, because we were doing some work on image recognition and this was the latest um, newspapers that had been published with the most high resolution um, images within the newspapers. Um, and I will show you in a minute what a drop off was. So we worked um, closely with the ICT team of um, uh, the KBR and they produced something uh, called the KBR Data Send Service, which was uh, based on some software um, and data transfer software from the University of Southampton. And what they did is um, we got emails. So here, so if we were doing one of the scenarios from 1913, each of the researchers um, got an email and then they were able to, that had been packaged. There was a script that was made in order to make those packages to make that a little bit easier. And then the researcher got an email to say um, that they could download the data. Um, oops, wrong one, wrong one. Just before I go to that, this is interesting because this is a sort of like the uh, first step towards an API. Just a, a couple of points that I didn't put on the slide. First thing, um, we sent the email to everybody in the team and it was a bit of the bystander effect. Many people forgot to download the file before it expired. Um, that was one thing. But they also, secondly, they needed to put the data somewhere. Um, it was it was not enough to have it on the laptop. It was too big. So in the end, we uh, created a next cloud environment to store all of that data as well. So this data transfer issue was um, not a uh, easy thing. And I just wanted to share this as well. This is something that Europeana has been working on as well. Um, they've got an FTP server and they're starting. So their prerequisite is that the objects have to be uh, have been published in Europeana, but they're starting looking at collections as data for Europeana too, which I think is an exciting move. I just wanted to mention this very briefly, um, but um, this is where the corpora come in as well. So we're very lucky in the project. We're working with a team of data scientists who are able to analyze the data and they're interested in, in various different pipelines of not how you can just extract the underlying files, but how you can do some analysis on the files um, um, related to the extractions as well. Um, I just share this with you. So this is the portal. This is a kind of demonstrator portal where you can also have a play with some of the techniques that they, they have used. But here, for example, they've been working on um, article segmentation. So at the moment, the KBR doesn't have article segmentation in the digitized newspaper, so it's per page at the moment. So they've been training algorithms to uh, automatically segment the articles. Um, and for the, for the first data extraction now, all of those files that have been extracted have now been run through the article segmentation. So we've got article segmentation on each of those files that have been extracted. A second step they've been working on is also to do named entity recognition. So once the articles have been extracted, then they run uh, uh, NER um, uh, uh, algorithms and things through the, the uh, extracted corpus and they can also do a uh, named entity li linking. So for example, here, one of the politicians, we they've linked through to Wikipedia page about that. But of course, Wikipedia is just an example of where you can link through to other sources. And finally, they've also been looking at the images um, as well. So what they've done is automatically extracted the images and then done some image similarity uh, algorithms. So you can see, um, oh, I didn't put it on this slide actually. There's a guy with the big, big nose and in one of the image similarity algorithms, there was a picture of France, which I was thought was uh, <laughs> fantastically, that, that had been matched as well. So if you have a look on this kind of demonstrator, you can see what this kind of thing looks like. And the idea is maybe this kind of um, functionality can be fed back into the newspapers portal as well. 
Um, and uh, hopefully, if it goes to publication, uh, Dilawa Ali, who is the person who's done a lot of this work and he's doing his PhD in this area as well, hopefully we'll have an article published relatively soon to sort of uh, explain a bit, a bit, a little bit about the various AI approaches that we've been using with the historical newspapers. So now I'm taking it a little bit broader off to finish. Um, I've mentioned the International Glam Labs community. I don't know, I know some of you know, has anybody heard of this um, before? Ah, more people have heard about this as well. So that, that's great. So we were very lucky uh, um, around uh, 12 of us. Um, we got to sit in a hotel room in Qatar for seven days to write a book, which was uh, probably a very, it was a very mind blowing experience, but the, it's uh, open a glam lab. Um, it's available as it's a public domain publication um, available on the web. It's available in, in various different formats and you can read everything through. But I just wanted to point here, there is a chapter on rethinking collections as data within the open a glam lab. So that may be interesting reading. And this was only launched last week. Um, so my colleague Gustavo, who does the other notebooks that, and the collections as data methodology, um, he's part of the International um, Glam Labs community. And what he's been doing is collecting examples of the use of Jupyter notebooks with collections as data in library, um, in library um, contexts. So he's tried because he's a Wikidata guru uh, as well. He's tried to create a visualization of that with all of the different logos as well. Um, but pay, maybe have a look at that because like the Data Foundry, um, Library of Congress, British Library, there are a number of different uh, National Library of Estonia, for example. There's um, uh, examples of where both collections as data and uh, Jupyter notebooks have been used to analyze that available on this page. So just going, I've got about five minutes left, I think. I just wanted to share a couple of things about this idea about corpus building. So some of you may know that the, there was a European project called NewsEye. And, and here, Sarah Oberbleicher, who works at the University of Innsbruck, together with some of the NewsEye colleagues, they looked at um, integrated interdisciplinary workflows for research on historical newspapers. What I find very interesting is that they take the perspective of the librarian, they take the perspective of of the digital humanities researcher, and they also take the perspective of um, the computer scientist and try to see how um, the needs of each of these communities can be infrastructurally realized, let's say. And this was published in JSIST uh, last summer, and so I would say it's open access. It's uh, really a nice article to read. And the same uh, person, Sarah, she also um, made some NLP notebooks related to the News Eye Corpus as well, um, and she published them online. Um, so you can see the kind of things that she was doing in a Jupyter notebook way with digitized historical newspapers. Um, this is the the, the um, uh, event that uh, Steven and other colleagues from Europeana organized. Um, just to sort of share this. This is where the collections as data um, guru, uh, Thomas Bedia came and presented at the Europeana Research Cafe, which is an informal, it's just kicked off an informal uh, um, webinar where people can come together and exchange ideas. Um, here is the slides from his presentation, and I'm very interested to see how we can continue this collections as data movement um, in Europe. And just these bonus slides, so I had this slide already. Um, Francisca mentioned this very briefly um, yesterday as well. So this is the European Data Space for Cultural Heritage. So this is um, a European initiative and there are going to be various different data spaces. And um, this is, there is one for tourism, I think, one for research, and this is the focus on one for cultural heritage data. And Europeana is um, centrally involved in this. So this was only sort of launched in November last year, and they've got the first calls open with the deadline of um, sometime in May, looking at um, small and medium enterprises. But I think this is very interesting to keep an eye on. And especially um, 
and I think that this isn't clear how this links to um, the European Open Science Cloud. So last year, um, or two years ago now, that's gone quickly, um, Daria um, presented a paper about cultural heritage data as humanities research data. And one of the things that we wanted to do with this paper was say that if you've got something like the European Open Science Cloud, cultural heritage data is essential for, um, for humanities research. So we wanted to sort of put that idea out into, out into the world. So the European Open Science Cloud, this is we had an event as part of the EOSC Future, which is one of the European projects trying to build the EOSC now. But those slides at the top are from uh, Paolo Mangi, who is very much involved in the data si side of um, uh, EOSC. Um, and he's working for the open, open Air, which I'm sure many of you will know. But here are the presentations plus the recording available online. So they had a specific session on looking at what is the potential role of libraries in the European Open Science Cloud. And there were colleagues from Clarin, Sesta, Daria in there as well. So I think this is an interesting area to keep an eye on. And Francisca mentioned this as well. This is kind of like the social sciences and humanities part of EOS, because this is one of the core services, the open marketplace. And the idea of this is you've got research data, you've got tools and services all described and then can be passed on to the EOSC. And I just wanted to share one of those. So we talked a bit about workflows and chaining of tools from the data through to the analysis. In the, uh, in the shock open marketplace, there is the possibility of doing this. So this is, for example, how to create a dictionary in the TEI, the text encoding initiative. And then you can sort of make some of these workflows reproducible. So this is kind of the documentation. So my last slide now, just thinking this, this is my ultimate dream. So I just wanted to share it with you. And this is, is, this is part of the work we do in Flanders um, related to Claria. So we've got both Clarin and Daria in Flanders. My ultimate dream is, I've, we've called it here, humanities research data providers, also known as cultural heritage institutions. My dream is that we put the digitized newspapers onto the high performance computer. Then, depending on what kind of analysis, so here you've got the sort of more computational analysis where you may be running OCR algorithms, image processing algorithms in order to prove the, improve the data sets. But then you might have Jupyter Notebook analysis as well. So once the corpora have been prepared, you can analyze them with topic modeling or um, concordances or whatever in order to analyze that data. And then all this data flows very nicely through to the European Open Science Cloud. So that's my dream and that's where I'll end. Thanks very much. Hello everybody and I noticed I've got a typo on my first slide which is a very good start. <laughs> okay, um, what I'm going to do is try and talk about uh, a little project that's just started. In fact it started last week um but it's something i've been talking about with people like henny for a long time and it's going to build on some of the presentations you've already heard and follows on from there um, but it's very focused on really trying to solve a, a particular set of problems that people have discussed um, today about how we make library collections available so digital texts are really in quite an interesting place um this is a slide from another presentation, but you know, text started with you know, pictographical, geographic origins, uh, developed into a serialization of spoken language. And in a lot of cases, it was um, quite fragmented, um, mainly because of the tech carrier technology you had then. So text appeared as labels on things. Um, and the longer forms really only emerged as um, carrier technology evolved. So you've got paper, print, and other things like that. And then the emergence of mass print really led to an explosion of large volumes of linear text and uh, a decrease in actual the mixing with non-textual content. What's happened with digital text is now we've started to see the re-emergence of some of these um, patterns of text use. So we've now got an explosion of new semi-pictorial forms of text. You've got ASCII art, you've got emoji, you've got cowmoji, um, which are designed to be sort of language independent, but already we're seeing divergent cultural and event-specific interpretations of those particular characters. 
So, for example, um, the eggplant, um, as well as representing the vegetable, has a very rude meaning. meaning. Um, and in Chinese, for example, uh, mainland Chinese, uh, not Taiwanese, um, the smiley emoticon with a closed mouth is actually condescending. It's kind of like the Japanese faint smile when you're dealing with foreigners, for example. Uh, and if you want to generally mean you're happy, you need to actually be showing your teeth in the smiley. Um, so the use of these characters is already diverging in different cultures, even though there's, there's no spoken language with those um, representing cultural norms. What we've also seen is a proliferation of communication channels. So people move, don't ordinarily now reach their audience through a single channel. Um, there'll be multimodal communications. And what that means is that's the way academic and intellectual and cultural discourse now happens. And if you want to attempt to capture that and talk about that and un understand the meaning and context of some of these um, textual objects, we actually have to start to look at this much broader uh, mass of objects that's sitting out there. And we've seen an explosion of embedded content in text documents now as well. So we've now got things like music encoding initiative, MathML for embedding equations, you've got images, you've got graphs, you've got executable material embedded in textual documents. So they're much more complicated than they used to be. And what this means is from a digital humanist point of view, actually talking about um, the texts, um, mapping those, constructing narratives is much more complex than it used to be. Stuff isn't sitting around in nice, easily packaged little things like books anymore. So we have an enormous amount of textual format diversity, and text is now always going to be stored in a variety of formats to reflect their particular use cases. That's just a fact of life. You know, much as yeah, you know, much as it might be nice to have everything in TI, it's not going to happen. There's huge volumes of PDF out there, which is not wonderful. A lot of them are folk, almost all of them, in fact, are basically about short term utility. So they're not really interested in effective or good structured information capture. They want to look good immediately, be readable, look nice. Generally, the underlying structure can be quite terrible. Um, most of them are still wedded slightly to the historical past, so they're really designed for final format publishing. They're not really designed for reuse and ongoing um, construction or re revision. That's beginning to change, though. And a lot of the formats are quite badly specified. So the Office formats, PDF, a lot of the X, SGML, XML things were all iteratively designed really by bolting on features. There wasn't any structured overall plan on the design of these. And what that means is they're very difficult to validate, very difficult to design general purpose tools that work for all the particular cases in the, uh, in the digital preservation world. There is an entire sort of research ongoing research project just to work out how to validate a PDF reliably. <laughs> um, and, you know, that's the vast majority of stuff we have sitting around in libraries and publications is PDF. Um, so lots and lots of versions. They like adding new features because they look nice without any regard as to whether those are actually going to be maintainable in the long term. We've got a whole load now of stream formats, more dynamic text formats, so things like Twitter and email which have an embedded structure. There are multiple authors. There are multiple versions of particular documents in there. There are multiple views. Do you follow one hashtag? Do you follow a particular person? In email, do you view it in order of time or do you view it in order of discussion threads or do it in order of sender? Um, there's no particular canonical state of that particular text. It depends on the user. In those cases, you really need to start to load those into something that resembles a database in functionality to enable you to appreciate those different angles. And a lot of fragmentary texts have now emerged in a big way. So you've got meme captions, hashtags, tweets, all of these little bits of text starting to occur in the discourse. Oh, sorry. Wrong way. Um, and then we come down to the multi hierarchy problem, which is something Andreas has actually talked about and written about quite a lot, which is the majority of text formats try to arrange the text in the hierarchy manner uh, xml that's the way it goes tech which codifies typesetting practice to some extent is, is a hierarchy construct um and you've got ti you've got open office pdf it, to some extent and even the the object model that is used by browsers to put text up is basically hierarchical but even then there's a basic dichotomy um, between um, the physicality of like the book that you're trying to represent and actually the, the semantic structure you've got there. So do you break it down into a volume page line or do you break it down into sort of 
chapter and paragraph and sentence. And you can see sort of in something like HTML, um, paragraphs aren't actually marked as blocks, you just have breaks where a new paragraph starts and you have to implicitly know that what sits between two key tags is a paragraph. It's not part of the implicit structure. So we want to talk about text really breaks down into there are many ways of approaching text. There are a lot of hierarchies that you can impose on that text or actually structure at a particular time. And if you try and push everything down into one hierarchy, you end up with a sort of epistemological mess of structure and semantics, interpretation and annotation, all, all trying to basically structure that document for you. And actually teasing that out and making that understandable to a person and viewable is very, very difficult. And it also means it's very hard to cite and reference a bit of a text at a granular level because you've got all of these conflicting structures sitting there. So what I want to be able to do with the text, and this is an example from IIIF, and as one of the people who created IIIF, it's nice to hear people say nice things about it and good. But I do believe IIIF provides at least some of the models for how we can approach text. But over here, what I've got is several different annotations where two or three overlap different sections of that particular image in different ways. And doing that when you've got a hierarchical structure and being able to pull those out is very, very difficult. But I want to be able to do that with text. So the way you do that, and that's been referred to several people, again, Andreas has also talked about this way back, is you need a, a standoff markup or standoff annotation mechanism. But in order to do that, we need a standardized way of referencing text and bits of the fragments of text underneath that's to, as much as possible independent on the underlying storage format. You really want some sort of underlying structure of the text and your coordinate system down there. And you can use that citation and referencing that uh, uh, as a person, but you also want it to be actionable as an API for machine access. I think that's one of the shifts is to try and put machine machine access on here so you can use your analytics tool quite easily. So it requires persistent identifiers and a coordinate system that probably at a higher level than just the individual characters and glyphs. Um, and what that does is try and separate the content from the rendering and the rendering is context dependent, depends on the, the, the hierarchy you wish to impose upon that. It's not completely simple. Um, there's no, not going to be a single way. For some forms, line breaks matter, for other ones not, if you, could, if you can reflow flow, flow that prose. Um, so I expect there to be more than one coordinate system, depending on the nature of that particular text. Um, I think another thing that is important um, we're starting to see is that texts, especially digital ones, actually evolve over time, even historical ones. Um, so some idea of versioning and differencing and understanding how texts differ. Uh, starting to represent an individual document, not as a static block, but as a sequence of events or as a stream of different versions, um, is going to make referencing much easier going back there. And what I want to be able to do is for these sorts of things to actually be a peer with IIIF images and image fragments, um, with PIDs, with other things, so other, to be other nodes in the graph, and to be actually peers with all the other digital objects that we sit out there. Um, so we can actually build a much broader and much richer framework. So I'll give you a bit of an introduction to the project. Unlocking Digital Text is a two-year project funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council in the UK and the National Endowment for Humanities in the US uh, under a program called New Directions in Digital Scholarship. And it started last week, <laughs> um, just after the bank holiday in the UK, and our first face-to-face -face meeting is on Friday. <laughs> Um, we did plan to start this a little bit earlier, but the last funding round, unfortunately, our US partners were hit by a hurricane just before submission and had other things to worry about. Um, and the idea really is to develop some outline standards and prototypes, and proofs of concept of basically the interoperable text framework. We aim to emulate the approach um, we use with IIIF. Uh, one of the things we did early on in IIIF is we sat down and said, OK, we need a better way of putting image resources online. And then we sat down and said, OK, what's the most awkward material that we as libraries hold? So we sat down with libraries and said, yeah, what is the stuff that's most difficult to deal with? And we came up with medieval manuscripts because they're not rectangular, they write in random directions, they've got holes in, all sorts of stuff. 
um, and they fall apart and the bits are all over the place, all over the world. So we chose that as the most pathological case. And the answer is if we, if we work on that and if we can make a reasonable hash of solving that particular problem, pretty much every other image representation we ever need to do is going to be easy. So we have kind of adopted this case and I'll talk about the use cases we've got here. Partners are Oxford, Cambridge and Notre Dame in the USA. Uh, and mainly because of the particular projects involved and because I know people there. So it's anchored very much in actual digital resources that already exist and the scholars that are working on them have worked in them. So there's already a body of scholarly material that needs to be represented or re-delivered through this. Uh, so it's about ongoing use of content. It's also about trying to standardize platforms to make things more sustainable. This is a proof of concept, not in develop all the software in this time, um, but we want to prove that this can be done. Um, we're very workshop focused. So one of the reasons I'm here is to say, if anybody's interested in this, we're going to be putting out calls for people to attend the workshop, bring their use cases along and help us brainstorm our way towards um, getting this specification done. We're going to do this primarily online. Later in the project, we hope to do some in-person events. So, Oxford, the chosen one is the Samuel Beckett Archive, which is actually located in Antwerp. And it's actually the product of, I think, about a dozen different academic institutions all over the place, scholars there, all working together in different bits and pieces. But one of the leads on that, Dirk Van Huller, is now in Oxford. Um, so he's actually one of the co eyes on the project. It has many different document types. It's got his letters, it's got his plays, it's got his personal library, which has been digitized, and it's got his marginalia in it, all sorts of bits and pieces. Consequently, we've got a mix of different formats. So we've got stuff in TEI, we've got stuff in PDF, we've got digitized images. And there's a whole load of different approaches. It's a, it's a wonderful site. It builds on, builds in an awful lot of the tools that I would like to be able to do in text in one go. So we've got text analytics, we've got narratives, we've got calendars and timelines, we've got links and themes going through all sorts of different types of documents. So it's a wonderful resource, but it's currently relies on the enormous amount of bespoke code to actually make it work. Uh, and long term, that's going to need maintenance. But at the moment, everything is custom created. Long term, what we want to do is replace as much as that as possible with a standardized platform, uh, which means this thing then can continue to evolve and grow without enormous maintenance cost, uh, which speaking from the point of view of a library uh, sitting there is something very interested in. Cambridge are providing the Casebooks project. Um, it's a um, medical record, medical casebooks um, from a couple of people in the 16th century. Um, they are astrologers as well as um, uh, medics uh, 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 and other things, but they're enormous books with many, many entries on each, on each page. Uh, what's interesting about this is it is all about the text fragments, although it's been digitized, oops, all about the text fragments, the individual cases, which means if you're tracking a first all case history, you're wanting to pull little fragments out of all of the different notebooks and run that person through there. If you're looking at astrological and ecclesiastical analyses, you're again pulling out different themes um, from throughout those books. And those were done in historical times to satisfy their needs. Uh, and then you've got modern geographical and epidemiological analyses. A lot of TIXML in there, a lot of mining in there, a lot of better data, a lot of links out there. Again, lots of bespoke code. Notre Dame, Thomas Harriet. Um, this is actually sat in Berlin, the um, original resource in the ecosystem. Again, collaboration of multiple institutions, but one of the major scholars happens to be Notre Dame. So you notice these things are very much researcher led, although we've got libraries and the organizations behind them. We're kind of working with the researchers' concerns, so we're very focused on that particular use case. All variety of different bits and pieces. There's XML images and diagrams. There's tech because there's quite a lot of mathematics in there. There's PDFs and uh, a wonderful one. Harriet has his own cipher, which is based on the Algonquin Native American language, which is probably going to be challenging because I'm pretty sure we don't actually have a Unicode space for that. Um, lots again of narratives. He was a polymath, so any single document includes all sorts of themes and interests to Harriet. And there's been a lot of work done actually mapping particular ideas as it goes through different manuscripts and different documents, letters, other things like that. Um, we've got early images and annotation, which could really benefit from some IIIF there. 
Um, Echo is getting quite long in the tooth at Berlin. Uh, so we would like to actually bring this up to date, but there's a considerable amount of work that could actually be re-delivered there. And this is one of the interests. The other thing that they're doing very much is they use this actually as a teaching corpus. Um, so actually getting the pedagogical and teaching angle in there is very useful as well. So each of these projects brings something quite different um, to the thing. We are looking for more. <laughs> so others are welcome. So um, Penny, uh, the humanities cluster, been doing, there's some guys there doing some work on text as graph. Um, so just spitting up an individual graph of words and navigating that as you merge multiple documents together. We've got text as a process at Quill Project in Oxford, which is looking at negotiating text. So the, the process of producing a treaty, who edits what, how those different things. So that's very much a, a process oriented view of text. We've got the EPAD group in Stanford who are looking at email, all sorts of things. And from my point of view, we have some existing documents which have up here is the um, Book of Curiosities in the Islamic world, and that has parallel transcriptions, transliterations, and translations all sitting side by side at the moment, fragment by fragment. So you can't actually download a translation as a complete text. It's all annotation fragments. What I would like to do is change that into a set of images, a complete transliteration, complete transcription, and just have annotations saying this bit of that image is that bit of that document. Um, that's what I want to do with that. And then we've been talking to people like Alto, and since I'm part Chinese, ideographic scripts and how you approach tokenizing those, which is quite diff more difficult than words, shall we say, uh, wants to come into there. So who we are, uh, just a list of the people. Um, so we've got people from libraries, we've got people from digital scholarship centres, people from the faculties of English, um, again, science, technology and values, data and society. So very much a mix. As you said, sort of librarians, scholars, technologists will bring those together, try and work on those. Um, there are going to be more people in that list as well, and anybody else who wants to come along. So, inspirations. IIIF Image API provides us the standard way of accessing images and fragments. But the presentation API is very interesting because it allows you to define an arbitrary collection of images which are pulled from anywhere. That's basically a virtual corpus if we did the same thing with text. It also allows you to, within a particular canvas for one particular thing, to assemble fragments in different ways. That again is, you know, something of interest we want to do with text. So that model, and not this is not within IIIF, it's taking inspiration from it, which would interoperate with it, but it's a separate project. Um, Browser-based viewers for different formats gives us a reasonable, um, reasonable hope that we can actually map most of these formats into some sort of basic coordinate system because they're all representable or mappable to varying degrees of extent. So there'll be stars on some of my slides which says, yeah, with, with some caveats. Um, can be mapped there. And for example, the hypothesis service for web annotation uh, allows you to do a lot of things there. Uh, and, you know, Perseus has been around the canonical text service. Again, it's a text API, but it does require an awful lot of work on the text beforehand to actually make it accessible by the API and it has performance. Use the database approach to work that well. A lot of existing work. Um, some of the some of the things in this room mentioned. So TI, text grid, etc. I've been talking about this with Wolfram for ages uh, since I worked for him in Oxford. Um, presentation API already mentioned. Um, we've done some work with Invenio RDM. Uh, so the idea that a list of annotations, as you talked about. Um, can be published as a work and it's now understood by ORCID as well as a work. So we use that to authenticate and label annotation lists, which says, OK, somebody has annotated this moment, triple IF image or collection of images, their annotations effectively can be published as a commentary on that particular image. Um, with Transcribus and others, we've done a lot in terms of machine generating annotations. Uh, so you generate those annotations, you can then correct those and use those to train another iteration of the ML system that you're using. So again, that's something we want to do in text. One of the advantages is being able to just see, in this case, the image and then see the machine generated translation, compare those to human generated um, annotations. Sorry, it's very interesting. Um, some work has already been done, uh, as Henny's talked about, uh, on APIs and getting done some text mining work and again looked at text APIs as well. So I want to pick up that stuff. And you guys have that on the advisory board as well. 
Um, versioning, um, Memento already exists as a standard for accessing versioned um, online objects. Uh, and uh, another thing I've been working on, the Oxford Commons file layout, which is a standardized way of storing versioned digital objects. Uh, and a whole load of things. One of the things I want to emphasize is that I'm not trying to devise a new text format. I've got enough of those already. And this is going to be a standard which says, there should be no code dependencies on these. These will be standards that can be implemented in multiple places. So, the main things we're going to want to deliver is a way of doing structured text fragment references and an API that implements that. Um, reiterating things, you know, unique identifiers, profiles for different textual forms, which defines the addressing scheme. Um, we find in text scholarship. There's an awful lot of redundancy in terms of people using different terms for the same thing. Um, I don't have any time for that. I'm going to map all of those. We'll choose one term and say basically all of these are the same. So there'll be a mapping exercise in there. It's going to be machine and human orientated. So if you want to retrieve something, formats we're looking at, bare text, constraint set of TEI, uh, some sort of simple HTML fragments that can be displayed easily, and some way of retrieving whatever the original was, whatever that format is. Um, so a lot of use cases for looking at those come out of the um, Goli projects we're looking at. Uh, and I mentioned down here before I saw Henny's presentation about flattening um, something into annotation markup and exploding it also into base text plus annotations on there. And uh, looks like you're untangled. There's pretty much that already, which is wonderful. Uh, I thought it was possible. You've basically done that. That's wonderful. Um, so, and then work on a prototype text server. Um, so, persistent identifiers, a bit of versioning. We won't support every text format out there, but we have the ones we're interested in our particular projects. If people have code for dealing with other formats, we're quite welcome to deal with it, but these are the sorts of things we're going to deal with. Um, there are a whole load of issues around Unicode that people don't discuss, which is the fact that Unicode is not. Um, has multiple ambiguous ways of representing any particular character or word. So it's possible to have two Unicode documents with completely different byte sequences that represent the same actual physical text. Um, there's, so there's a whole load of issues around Unicode normalization that we'll have to deal with before we even start dealing with higher level abstractions of text. Apparently because the people who design Unicode <laughs> have been taking things, I think. I don't know why. This is about a proof of concept. Um, completely generic TI or XML is going to be problematic because there are so many variants. Um, but again, Untangle ought to be able to explode that to an extent. And I could see that us keeping certain structural elements is very useful to us and converting the rest into standoff annotations, which means we don't have to worry too much about those particular niceties or ambiguities. Ambiguities and gives us a nice base to work on, framework to work with. So, Couple of workflows there, um, but I'm not going to go through those in detail. That's from me. Thank you very much.